when, when you publish a book in 88, then it reprints twice in 99, then again in 01, 02, 03, 04... 05, 07, 08, and then has a second edition in 2010. Um, that means there's traction. That means there's engagement. That means there's truths in what he's saying. And I think that sets the platform for me in terms of saying, well, people have listened, not everyone, but people have listened and we've now moved into a new period and I want to tap in a little on that. But just to start with, where, where did your interest in environment and sustainability begin for you to say, OK, I'm going to turn my little terrace in Chippendale into a model? The best answer I can give to, give to that is... Um a sort of visceral, a, a gut moment when I was the consultant to the 1993-94 inquiry into Sydney Water and I was uh, looking at the technical, legal and practical ways of managing the city's water and I had um, a gift from my family on the farm. I had a really strong bullshit meter on the farm, and I had it go when the top end of town, the bottom end of town, everybody was really saying it's pretty good. A few things we need to do with our water and sewage. And um, I have two further parts to the answer to Costa's question. I, um, I, I did law, or rather it did me, and the disability that it gives you is you get a higher opinion of yourself than you should have. During the inquiry I had an opportunity to sit outside a hut in the mountains with my then wife's father, and he said to me when I was talking about the inquiry, he said, so you're going to clean up the water, are you? So um, I thank him for that question. I realised the report would sit on our shelf. The final part of the answer is engineers kept saying you can't drink water, you can't do this, you can't do that. And the benefit of growing up on a farm is you can't go to town to get a doctor. You can't go to town to get a plumber. You can't go to town to get the lettuce. It's too far. And it costs too much petrol in 1955 when you don't have the, the money for that. Or, in my case, I got lucky I didn't get to town for three months because we were flooded for three months and a gypsy moth plane would fly over and drop some food out in a sugar bag. I learnt the truth. So the answer to Costa's question is, people said to me at the inquiry about Sydney's water, you can't do that. So basically, it was a boy from the bushes, childish direction to being told you can't do that. And I thought, fuck you, I'm going to do it. So I did it because I thought the report would sit on a, a, a shelf, gather dust and go nowhere. And the body politic that we're carrying today would do nothing real. So I decided to drink my rainwater in the city, recycle my sewage and do what farmers do all the time. Across Australia, three million Australians drink rainwater every day and no one dies. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> So you've, you've seen it from both ends of the spectrum. At the moment, and as you heard, gatherings like this, we've got a, a new energy. There, there is an incredible energy about what's going on in the world around us today and people are taking action, whether it's Transition Bondi, whether it's the idea out of a film to do something about sustainable seafood. 
you you started i mean you cut your teeth in a period when we were living in largesse in the 80s and the 90s when resources were endless and we could just dig down the 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 sand dunes of Kernel, which I walked over the top of those for a geography excursion, and it took an hour and a bit to get to the water. All that sand is now in the buildings and the facades of Chatswood High Rise. So y you've come through that, and you now, in 2012, you've written a book which is a progression from Sustainable House, of course, but how have you seen this transformation over time to be sitting in 2012 now? Hmm. There was a, a great line by um, Murray Wilcox, who was a lawyer and then a judge, now retired. He said, no legislation ever rises above the level of its administration. And the, I mean, I have to say, I did all three aluminium smelters in the Hunter Valley. I did coal mines, I worked for the dark side. I have blood on my hands. And I was earning more in 1980 than I'm earning today. And I, I was the first environmental lawyer, so-called. And I did it because I love the earth. I thought I would use environmental law to do good things, and I realised that the more legislation there was, the more pollution and damage there was. And I realised I was on a fool's errand. So what I've learned in answer to Costa's question is, the more people talk about it, the more laws they made, the more jargon there is, the worse things get. I don't believe anymore. The only thing I believe in is the food I just ate, harvested by ordinary people doing wonderful things. I don't believe in government anymore. I don't believe in, in laws. I believe in you, in us and the power of us to do ordinary things that will bring about great change. So I've said goodbye to the law, and I say good night and hello to you guys. We are the change we need to be. Thank God for us. So I just want to say... I um, went to Council uh, Garden Awards on the weekend and I read, I read out from this list and I want you to tell me how you feel about something like this because this is what's going on. In two weeks, these things are going on. Sydney Food Fairness Alliance, Food Security Summit for World Food Day, Sustainable Communities Plan in Sydney City last night. Sydney Uni graduate farmers, ag students, where to from here? Parramatta Eco Living Festival, Waverley Council Garden Awards, composting conference, well that, that's in Young, so it's out of Sydney, most of these are in Sydney. ABC Garden Club No Dig Workshop, Coronga Special School Seed Saving Event, Redfern Global Seed Freedom Fortnight event, National Organic Week, Food and City Design Talk at UNSW, Paddock to Plate, Meet the Farmers at a Restaurant in Glebe, Transition Bondi, Sustainable Food Talk, Good Living Festival at Mamre Homestead, Fast Break, Young People at the Powerhouse Museum, 7.30 till 9 o'clock in the morning, five speakers, five minutes, get your point across. Excellent initiative. YFM, Youth Food Movement, putting on uh, a ride around the, the, the community gardens of Sydney and a picnic and people just con travelling along the way. The People's Food oops, the people's food Plan, Wild Weed Stories, Permaculture Course here in Bondi, Permaculture in, in, in a Sydney current, concurrent, the Beams Festival, bringing art and environment into the streets, Keep Australia Beautiful Council doing things, um, the Ecotopia Festival in Ramwick, the, the Writers, the Heaven and Earth Writers Festival, it goes on and on. Um, 
How does that position your thoughts when you see that that's a list of just two weeks in Sydney? Um, I've just come back from uh, an island called Lombok, which is about 35 kilometres uh, this side of um, Bali. And... Um, they held up some f uh, petrol tankers in the pu in the south of the island because they need petrol. Uh, Four hundred wells have run dry. Um, the Gili Islands, which are one of the most beautiful um, islands in the world, have water boats that take two or three trips to bring water across for the pools and the showers of the many Australian tourists. The islands are dying of climate change. There are two parts for me to the uh, question that, that Costa asked. Last night, I saw how wonderfully irrelevant and I saw my use-by date. Last night, there was the energy, confidence and positive energy of young people at the meeting that Costa and I were at. It was inspiring for me to see the positive energy of the young um, woman who was the MC and of Costa and other speakers. The, the people, I mean, clearly you look at me and you see damaged goods. <laughs> um, the energy that is now servicing to de deal with the unbelievable challenges we face. Now, it's the train smash is happening now. The energy that comes out of the list that Costa has just read to you is at least the match, I, I think, to the dimensions of the, of the damage that's happening in the wells of Lombok, in the Murray-Darling River system of Australia. It's the energy of the young people and their confidence to do things and their boredom with old farts who are grumpy about this and grumpy about that, which is going to get things done. That list that Costa read is the flag, the hope and the sign of success to me. And I think it's inspiring that Costa's read it out. It, to me, is the call to action, the message that we're on, on our way and that the mainstream media do not get it. We get it and Costa, Costa get it. So thanks for reading that out, Costa. You, you said before, food. So you've gone through this journey mm. and you've come to this point where you've, you've put your thoughts together mm. and you've said the answer is in food. Yeah. There's nothing like a short, balding, inadequate man to sort of personify failure. Here I am. Look at me. I had this internal meter that said... You're not really sustainable when all this TV and media is going on about the house. And I thought, could you just be quiet for a moment? Let me just enjoy this moment. But it wouldn't shut up. I'm 62 and around about um, four or five years ago, the house... Are you 62? Yeah. Oh. So the house... Um, how old are you, big boy? Well, <laughs> I didn't so anyway, 62. So anyway... <laughs> So the house saves 100,000 litres of water every year. It's not con connected to mains water or sewer. So what happens is that you think, OK, that's a good thing. But to put food in any person's tummy who eats the Australian average diet for 10 days requires at least 100,000 litres of water. About 2 to 3 million litres of water. So if there's 100 people here, four or five hundred million litres of water, just if we eat the typical Australian diet, not the food we've just had. Food 
is th causes the, the second highest amount of climate change pollution after coal coal-fired power stations. Twenty four percent of Australia's climate change comes from the growing production, transport and food. My house is trivial. What matters is how I grow, eat and deal with my waste food. That's why that meal's important. Hundreds of thousands of litres of water and tonnes of climate change pollution were avoided by the food we just ate. Make no, no mistake about it, we are the heroes in the room. We are doing what needs to be done. And what's been done here tonight on those modest plates is heroic. And we should never forget that we are doing what needs to be done every time we do those things. It's a great question, Costa. Thank you. Am I too serious? I'll sort of shake no, up we, a we, bit. Yeah. No, we'll get we'll get through that. We, but, but but we got to go. We got to go through. I, wa I wanted people to to go through and to to get in there and uh, and understand that you know a book, a second book like this. I mean. You don't just say, oh, I'm going to write a book on sustainable food. <laughs> like, there's, there's a lot behind it. And when, when did the title, well, not the title, but when, when did you sort of drive towards that? About four years ago, um, after I did this, I, I mean, I didn't have this level of clarity and in one moment, but I just thought, I've got to do something. And I've, I had a gift, I guess, because I had a small backyard and I couldn't grow all the food I needed, so I started growing it out the front. And in um, a haphazard way, I started getting some food from some local farmers, and I thought, I've got to really bring the council and government with me. So in, 19, sorry, in 2008, we had a Food for the Future Fair. We closed off um, a few streets. We had five farmers bring their trucks in. They sold all their food. The council gave us um, 200 fruit trees, which we planted. People who had never touched a shovel planted a tree. It, it transformed our suburb. In many ways. And I thought, I've got to start documenting that. I've got to get the figures down to change policies. I've got to do something which presents an argument that can be heard in local communities, in the media, at state and federal levels. So I thought, oh God, I've got to write another book. And I, <laughs> I'm never going to do it again. But anyway, it's out there now and it's got all the data in it, it can be used. It's I mean, the main challenge, I think, for anybody who's been to university is to overcome it, to write simply for people who don't have that formal education so that anybody, whether in Blacktown, Bondi, Chippendale, wherever, can read it and understand what's important. That's the real challenge. And I have been blessed. I've had a really... Um, good group of critics and a really good um, editor and a really good publisher and I think the book gets there it's a, a mixture of fact storytelling and photographs and drawings and I feel good about it I think that people like us can take the book to their counsellors to their staff and win the arguments I mean, you need to be clear. One quarter of our cities is owned by councils on trust for us and they have forgotten the duties they owe to us. One quarter of our cities is roads. And one of the best things that's happened to me over the last few years is this man on my right going out <laughs> and planting in full public gaze, food in the streets. He's jumped right over there. See, th see that, 
there's a classic case of dog jealousy. It used to be that the only things that trees in the street were, were good for were for dogs to piss on. Well, you, your time has passed. <laughs> You mentioned, uh, actually, I think that was your publisher on the phone here. It's, it's tooting. And I just want to grab mine. Oh, no, mine's there. God, I'm a bit of male blindness. I'll turn it turn down. It down yeah. yeah. Throw it in the... Turn it down. Yeah. Um, okay, you mentioned, you mentioned something, storytelling. How have you managed, because like Sandy here is, is embarking on, you know, bringing awareness about the garden beneath the sea. Um, how have you managed to be a creative storyteller all these years? And what hurdles have you loved? What hurdles have you hated? How have you told stories? That's a great question. Um, particularly for me as a lawyer. I mean, the hard thing for lawyers is to tell the truth. And... Um, I've, I've learnt that I, if I can look the camera in the eye or the journalist and tell the truth, I don't have to worry about anything if I just tell the truth. And the truth sets us free. And the truth is ours. And the truth is on the streets and in our gardens. So every time I talk to anybody, I say, look, I'm not a gardener. You know, my plants die, but some live. I just tell people how ordinary I am. And just to show you how I'm a slow learner, I've had over 19,000 people through the house. For a while, I, well, for most of the time, I couldn't understand why people came. I thought, it's just a kitchen and bathroom renovation. And it took me that many people on that length of time to understand that it had value and the value it has is not discussed it's the unspoken words it's the, the fear that's not admitted to that really holds us back from doing things we need to do so when I was married if there was a, a couple there the, the woman would hang back and talk to my wife and she, she would say What's it really like? <laughs> the big questions. You know, boys, they want to talk about pumps and the mechanics. And that was a really powerful moment to learn that people are actually afraid of a water-efficient shower head. They're actually afraid of an energy-efficient light bulb. I guess in a way it's like the love that dare not speak its name. People are afraid to say, look, I want to do something, but I'm afraid it won't work. It's really interesting. Here we are in a moment in human history when we have so much wealth, quote unquote education, and we're actually afraid to try new things. I condemn primary, secondary and tertiary education because it's taught us to be afraid of making mistakes. Damn that. Everything that's been good in my life has been because of the mistakes I've made. And our middle class culture is afraid of making mistakes when they're thinking about going sustainable. If there's one thing I'd like you to take away tonight is go out and make as many bloody mistakes as you can. Kill as many bloody plants as you can, but have a go. Because the only judge that matters is you and once you've had a plant that gets up and you've tasted it, you're away, you're free. Yeah, that's true. I mean, doing, doing the verge as I've done, um, people driving up the street looking at it would stop initially after about the first three weeks and the plants were just going... <laughs> and people would stop and they'd wind down the window. What are you giving them? What are they on? And I say, sunlight. <laughs> a little bit of water. And, yeah, it's that, it is that fear. It, it, it's, th there's fear around everything that we're heading into. And to step out and say, well, 
we're going to gather here tonight. We're going to make a stand. We're going to say support transition. We're, we're, we want to hear about your book. Most of all, we want to hear about your road and your experiences because those fears are still there and the structures, while some are crumbling, they're still there. So what's been, what's been your inner mechanisms to deal with walls Oh, and speed man. humps and spikes on the road. Good questions, Costa. Look, I've been at my weakest in the last two or three years. I've had people who I had to dinner who were friends who've become the Loch Ness monster in my life. I don't understand it. People who've, you know, been my friends for 10, 15 years have suddenly said terrible things about me that I haven't heard, heard about except second hand. And they're four or five houses away. Not a lot, but enough. You only need about three or four people who've got a, a knack of getting your Achilles heel to really bring you down. And if they're your friends or your neighbours, they can really bring you down. I've had some tough moments with this stuff with food. Words matter. Um, and I've been trained to listen to them. So when people say, look, I'm supportive of um, sustainability, but I know what they're saying is not like when an engineer said to me, um, you can't do that. What he's really saying is, I can't do that and I don't want you to try. And the thing that's brought me to the other side most times in those difficult moments is listening to the words that are used, understanding the fear that they reflect and then thinking, the only person who's going to give me the strength that I need is me. I mean, make no mistake about it. We're doing things that are quite challenging to some people. And they can be our closest friends, our lover, our next door neighbour, a counsellor we thought would support us, a media person. You'll all find this. It's a journey each of us have to take and have, I hope, the courage to say, oh, well, the only way I know is to go on. And it's tough sometimes. And if I can be of any use to you tonight, I'd like you to carry these words in those moments, which is, I can do this. Because you matter, each of you because you're out there in the front doing this stuff. So do think about that and I hope it helps you. I, I'm going to take a couple of questions in a second, but it reminded me of something that Russ Grayson, I, I don't know if you've heard of Russ Grayson around the, these networks. He was with Sydney City and he's a real champion of the community garden and city farm network um, along with his partner Fiona. He said an interesting thing and when, when, you, when you put this in perspective, it marries in beautifully what you said. Um, for example, when I first took on the role with ABC, people responded to websites, people respond to council, and usually the ones that have the time to sit at home and write something, because they're not here <laughs> being proactive, are the negative voices. And you ask any of the council people here in the room, as an obligation, they then have to respond to that. So, so much policy and guidelines, unfortunately, are driven by a consistent negative voice. So they have to respond, and then these people are the ones that go like this. And he, he put this post on my website, and he said, look, he said, I've read some of the comments, because, you know, our ABC, suddenly having a talking hedge on there, it was like, oh, that's all a bit scary. So there was some pretty solid comments go out there. And he said, if you like it, you have to say something because 
otherwise there's there's hundred you know a few hundred out of x number of multiple thousands watching but a few hundred comments that's the proportion so so you know that's that's what you're you're up against but we need to be that voice on the all the platforms so when something is good support it but voice it and be active about that voicing otherwise anyone can write a negative comment and they will out of the fear would you agree yeah it's a really good point the first thing that the general manager of sydney city council said to me last night she said i've had a few some emails criticizing um the meeting because not enough notice has been given you know as i've got a th as though i've got a thousand dollars in the bank to go out and print leaflets it was a meeting we put together we had every intersection and road chalked it was up on facebook and you think to yourself exactly what cost is saying you've got to help those people in power and the best help you can give them is po positive feedback saying we want this Never assume because it's a good thing that's going to happen. Assume that you need to say that you want it to happen. Do assume that. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's such a simple thing. And uh, knowing, knowing people in positions in, in government and, and organisations, they, they're tied. They, they have to respond to that negative. And it drives them crazy because it's going to be that same email coming in every day. I'm never going to watch the show again because... And then next week, well, I'm turning off. And then next week, I'm still going to turn off. It, it, they haven't turned off for 34 episodes. So, y you know, so it's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And, and they're, they're bound by it. But then if we understand that that's how it goes, and the same thing happened in the street. We had some complaints. And... Council has to then go through the process of doing a survey. So they do a survey to then find that everyone was up for it and there was no legs. But all that energy was then foisted on the council who could have been putting the energy into the actual project and it's not their fault. It's actually, I go so far as to say it's ours for not really pushing it and, and making that effort and saying, I love it, full stop, that's all you have to do. Dear council... That initiative, I love it. If they want a bit more information, because. <laughs> <laughs> and then they can call you back and say, well, more information. But no, that, I, I joke, but, but, it's, but it's no joke. It's, it's so simple. And then, and then that supports them and it inspires them to then drive the initiative and promote it and, and build it. And, and it's not just about what I was talking about, but it's, it's about everything. It's about everything. So any, any questions up to this point? Um, I think it's a really interesting point that you, you guys touched upon uh, a minute ago about the importance of positive engagement because um, in the initiatives that I've been doing recently and I'm, I'm absolutely a novice, I, um, I don't have anywhere near the experience uh, as, as you guys do, um, but one of the biggest challenges has been talking to people on a day-to-day -day basis and telling them the importance of sustainability and not wasting the planet's very limited resources. And, you know, some people advocate, like, if you're running al along the beach, you know, and you're picking up rubbish, and people are throwing it around, and, and they're not thinking about it, a lot of people are tempted to kick sand in their face and scream at them and say, what are you doing? You know, don't trash our beaches. You know, but one of the most important um, things that I emphasize with, with, with my initiative is always, always keep it positive. Because once it becomes adversarial, your chances of succeeding go down dramatically because it becomes emotional. And then once it's emotional, it becomes defensive and it's an ego battle and that doesn't work. But I was wondering if you guys um, had any kind of perspective um, on um, some words to share on your experiences with um, you know, that, the, the, that sort of nature of engagement with people. I think the, um, the best advance I've seen is from the young people who have a greater sense of humour than my lot and um, are less prone to getting grumpy and are more positive on oriented. I think it's a generational thing. Um, it's not, you know, u uniform. 
you're obviously right. You've got to be positive and you can't start punching up somebody you disagree with or picking a fight. But the main thing is to stay cool um, and just... You can't get a win every time. You just have to... Thank you. It's so great to have a dog agree with you. <laughs> Enough of me. What I'm going to do, because there are some people in the, in the audience here who are um, in the book, is pass this book around. The book will be in the bookshops next week. If you want to, you can get it 20% um, off with this form or with this URL. So I'll pass the form around with that and so on. But there's some photographs of community gardens and things like that in there, so that can be going around while we're talking. But to, to quickly sum up what I've said is, anger is never a solution. And it's tough sometimes to, you just gotta suck it up. I really like the way you approached it. Um, that's all I can say. And Sorry, I might just add one other thing. Uh, that is also, it's very much about what the transition movement's all about. It's finding what you should do, not what you shouldn't do, and doing that. And promoting what you should do, not what you shouldn't do. So rather than not littering, look at an alternative that you should be doing. So rather than, for instance, protesting coal seam gas, look at where you should be buying your energy from rather than Origin Australia or Energy Australia, or one of those that invests in coal seam gas mining. So that's just one example, you know. People say, oh, well, you should stop doing this, but what you, we need to find something that we should do instead. So uh, you should stop shopping at Coles and Woolworths. Well, you should start shopping at the farmer's market. So, you know, it's, it's looking for those substitutes as well, I mm -hmm. think. It's a very powerful way to do it. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, on, on, on that one, like, I just think of those two initiatives that have come out of here. I mean, the, the joggers on the beach, but e even better, the, the one about the cups at the markets. I mean, each and every one of us can take that, that initiative into our workplace. We can take that initiative into our social circles. But you setting it up at the markets, it's not a stall saying, we must stop this. You're actually saying, well, why the hell can't we do that? Or not actually, why the hell? Actually, the hell, we are doing it. <laughs> and, and away we go. Yeah. So, so that's, th that's the... And, and, yeah. and what I was going to say, like, it's not about baggage. Like, there's a certain... When you get to a certain point, and, and having come through, and we talked about this last night, having come through as these elders, as these pioneers, having to wade their way through the era of largesse, you know, you've got roof racks and there's baggage yeah. on there. Yeah. There's big yeah. baggage and there's a box trailer yeah. because yeah. there's a lot of hurts, right? <laughs> but the difference you're talking about is young generation. They go, yeah, well, you know, Mobsy, yeah, you know, he's got a book. He's doing it. He's an elder. We love his work. But we're going for it. We're going to take your information and run with it. And we don't have a roof rack and we don't have yeah. a box trailer yeah. and there's no garage to yeah. store crap. Yeah. And... and and, and just that alone, when you step aside and say, well, you know, and as Lance said, it's not like stand out the front and say no to those big semis. Come, mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> just go and buy from somewhere else and be that, you, you know. So I love that thing about the cups. Yeah, um, so do I, yeah. Any, any yeah, we've got a question over there. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a cluster of things. Um, you guys both touched on a couple of things there with, with the troll situation you have online. You can disarm them with the truth. You don't have to attack back necessarily in your situation, but just say, well, here's the reality. Um, you can't refute it. That's the situation. Um, actually, it was almost exactly a year ago um, outside um, icebergs here, I some guy threw a cigarette butt right in front of me as I'm crossing the lights. I picked it up and took it to him and said, I think you just dropped something, mate. <laughs> and then, and then uh, he was so embarrassed, dropped his head, and a few people around clapped. And I thought, well, <laughs> but it's such a simple thing to do. It wasn't aggressive, and I didn't have a go at him. It was purely, um, you've done the wrong thing. Here's a little token of how stupid you've been. 
everyone else thinks you're an idiot around you, don't do it again. Um, you don't have to attack them, but you disarm them with the truth. And then they, they feel not necessarily humiliated, but humbled into doing something that's the right thing. And that goes with everything on the beach, I suppose, um, when people are doing the wrong thing there. Cheers. Sorry, uh, I no, don't sorry, mean no, to be... No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I will not accept that quick. Can you oh, rephrase you haven't that heard my question yet. I don't, I don't uh, that, that's another thing. Speaking of vocab, um, just can, can I ask you all one thing? Don't say sorry. It's, it's become a culturally... And endorsed. It's become a culturally accepted thing. Oh, oh, hi, sorry. What are you bloody sorry about? Don't be sorry, please. I, I am you grateful might. for your question. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> I don't want... It's going to come out as pessimistic. That's why I that's was right. That's all right. It's part of the process. And thank you very much for bringing ABC Gardening to the masses rather than to the older generation. And um, um, I work in schools, so I really appreciate what you're doing with schools as well. Um, this is more for Michael, though, because he's 62. I'm 41. When I was 20, I did my Bachelor of Environmental Science. And I was gung-ho, yay, activist, mostly about forests back then. Um, then the recession came, the one we had to have. There was no employment for me. There was nobody caring much about the environment then. Everyone was trying to get food on the tables. And we know as soon as the economy is down, environment goes out the window. No one gives it in. I guess what I've asked for a long time, I'm coming back into it now. I, I went into accounting. Um, I now have two children and now I'm really seeing the importance and also the crisis point that was always coming is here now. I just want to know, you've seen it all, is this another fad that I'm going to buy into and then everyone's going to get excited for a bit and then go off in another way? Look, lady, you're on your own. Uh, <laughs> who the hell knows the answer to that? Can I, can I just say, when I did the house, I did it as I answered Costa's question because people said I couldn't do it but also because I'd come to a stage where the law, who I thought would give me answers, had not given me answers. I'd come to the stage where I th I'd tried a whole range of things to do good and none had worked. And where I didn't like the sound of my own voice. I didn't like the way I looked in the mirror. I'd, I did not like the way I felt. When I did the house, it set me free. I stopped reading the paper as much. I stopped sounding like a pain in the bum. I felt better. I worked on what I could do about my own pollution. You can set yourself free here. You can grow your own food. You don't have to be the full body. You don't have to disconnect from water and sewage. You can be okay. Just the biggest thing you can do is grow or buy local food. And if, in doing that, you get answers about where we're going and whether it's the latest fat or whatever, give me a call and I'll buy a bottle of whiskey and we'll sort it out and maybe we <laughs> between the two of us we'll get some confidence about the answer. I have to say, the older I get, I know less now. I'm just starting to learn. I feel so unconfident about the answer to your question. I'm sorry. No, thank you. <laughs> oh, he did say sorry. You're not allowed to say sorry. Isn't that right, Costa? <laughs> sorry. Oh, he didn't start in sorry. Well, I don't know if this is a, uh, a question, but I, I resonate with, uh, with what you said about setting free. I been asking myself for a while now, why do I have to work an eight-hour job and uh, commute? Uh, and just the whole th way we live here. I come from another country, and, and it's the same thing. It's sort of like a global thing. But uh, it just, I went away and, and spent some time on a farm, on a on an organic farm, doing something completely alternative, different, and 
for about three weeks and I thought, why? I felt, I felt, yeah, I felt so much better on those three weeks than, you know, all the time. And this is a beautiful country. And, um, but it's just the way we got set things up that it feels so entrapping and so enslaving to me. I can't get away from the feeling. And then, for some reason, it really resonates that, you know, if it's true that the end of the war is, let's say, next year or whatever, I don't really, I probably couldn't care much as, as long as I'm doing something that makes me happy. I think for me now, at this point in my life, that's what is important. I want to be happy and I want to, and definitely commuting and working eight hours on, on a job that I don't get much, much satisfaction out of it. It's not, not really making me happy. So I think, I, because I have asked myself that question about, is the war about to collapse? Is the oil crisis coming up? It doesn't matter, I just want to be happy, so. Michael? Oh, I've got nothing to add. <laughs> Lancey's fired up. So, uh, yeah, I, I do, because I feel very strongly about the answer to both of these questions. Um, one is the question of, is this going to keep going, or is it just a passing fad? I think that it's certainly going to keep going, uh, and the, 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 the way I make the difference is because before it, it, um, it wasn't a necessity. The food on the table didn't relate to people's understanding of climate change, of peak oil. Now it's slowly, with the internet and with better communication and that kind of thing, we're actually learning more about how it is closely, relinked, closely linked and related. So I think out of necessity, absolutely, it's going to be more than a trend. Um, people are going to have to grow their own food because they just won't be able to afford to buy any other food. Um, and then in answer to Yvette's question, uh, certainly, if you want a sustainable life, if you want to keep doing something, it has to be something you enjoy. You can't live your life and not be doing something you don't enjoy because your life won't go on for very long. The more you love to do something, the more you will live and the more you'll enjoy it. And whether it's uh, to do it for the sake of the environment or just for the sake of your own peace of mind, you have to do what you love. And that will eventually link in with the environment. So, thank you. That's a good, good questions. Yeah, then I'm happy. I got plenty of time around. And yeah, you got to be passionate. If you see something that bothers you, just <laughs> straighten it up. You know, you just oh, see, it's not. Quite, oh, I'll get to that when, when we have dessert. But yeah, you can just do stuff. Say hello to people. Make a dif make, make a difference picture. in the day. Like if someone's driving down the street or you walk past someone, just look them in the eye and say hello. Uh, it's so simple. Uh, I mean, that's not necessarily going to... Yeah, actually, it will help change. And, and, you know, the other thing is get, it, get, into, get into meals like we just had. I mean, that, that, that ties in with the, with the theme of the book, Sustainable Food, and what was the bit in the meal. I mean... The, the wild greens that were in there, we were all eating, you know, variegated sorrel, there was dandelion, pickled homemade sauerkraut. I mean, you were making an environmental statement about working your inner composting system with the sauerkraut. That's what it's all about. This is, we need to work the inner compost. That's the gut. And then when you work with the gut, if you fuel the gut and feed the gut, then it'll give you the right gut feelings and you'll go where you need to go. So it's all about get the inner composting right. Anyway, I'm, di I'm digressing. I just uh, wanted to find out how much food do you think we can be growing for ourselves? Like, is it possible to become sustainable living in the urban environment? That's the, um, the heart of what the book, is can we do this in the city? There's some really... There's a, an example of Michelle Margulis' garden and what she grows. There's an example of um, a suburb in... Um, America where they grow a surplus and make a profit. Um, basically, 
there's lots of data in the book of success stories and I teased it out because I'm a lawyer and I, I work from the facts and I'm confident now that we do not need to get everything from a farm in South Australia. In the Second World War, um, England imported 60% of its food at the start of the war and 18 months later was growing 60% of its food. Um, there are people far more qualified than I who can say with great confidence that we can grow more than enough food in, a, in our cities. So I'm relaxed about that. The only problem is I can't do it. So I need you guys to... <laughs> the good gardeners, to really um, stay on board. Thanks for that question. So the gentleman with the um, inbuilt um, voice. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, just a thought, actually. I mean, everybody when they move into the new house, they fix the garden up, they always plant two or three trees, and the council and the new neighbourhoods and the planting rows of trees. Why do they do that? Why don't they just put in fruit trees? I mean, you can have a row of oranges down. Well, the, the answer is, I would say, in 10 years' time, that the suite of options that people choose will be the suite of options you're talking about. A combination of transition towns, Costa's program, people from all, s all parts of Australia, all over the world, are doing this. When the council planted some fruit trees in Peace Park and espaliered them, it was like the sailors taking over the Potemkin destroyer in uh, Russia. It was the beginning of a revolution um, inside the council. Um, Costa's right when he read the list out. The change is happening. It's happening so fast. The difficulty is sometimes to live in a job where you've got eight hours of uh, difficulty. I just want to uh, lighten your load if I can. Imagine a, um, a bloke trying to get away from it all and just have a few weeks respite in a tropical island. And after servicing and realising where he was after two weeks of being there, he noticed that there was a shitload of rubbish outside his villa all over the creek that ran beside the villa. And he realised that all of his sewage, all of the wastewater, everything, every bit of his excreta, all of the waste he put in the garbage bin was going into that creek right beside him. And then imagine this for that poor boy from a middle class, tertiary educated world. He stood there one day and saw a boy no older than six with a sister probably no older than three at great physical difficulty, push a bike up the steps from the creek, laden down with big bags of stuff he'd harvested from the creek, and alone, with his eyes on his sister, beckon her closer to him as he crossed the road with hundreds of scooters and motorbikes, calmly find his way across that, and take home the fruits of his hunting and gathering, which was my rubbish. So the question I asked myself, should I stop my waste going out there? I asked myself, what would the boy say if I took away his livelihood? Shit happens. Not just in the island of Lombok where I'm speaking of, for each of us when we go to work, when we, when we catch a bus. Life is not black and white. The only safe haven is inside us. The only answer we get comes from inside us. 
in my experience, the one thing I, I have groped towards some confidence about is this. If I grow some food where I live and work, I feel better about myself. I feel all the richness I need to feel inside and all the self-confidence. The other questions about whether or not you should go to work, whether or not it's a good job, you're on your own. That's all I can say. But I would say this. T turning up tonight, you're giving up a couple of hours. You're mixing with people that you otherwise wouldn't mix with at your work. You're already in the tunnel of change. You suddenly give up some time on the weekend and you grow a little bit of a garden. You're fueling yourself during the week. Those plants are growing. You join a community garden. You start to look at other alternative options, as Lance was saying, to find your food. You then engage with different people and all of a sudden someone's going to say, oh, we actually need someone to work with us on this. Or we need to, like pulling out of work, like that's always a reaction. I think use the work at the moment to, to, to supply your income and keep you steady while you exercise this new suite of options. Because within this new suite, your new option is waiting. It's just stepping out of the fear, disregarding all of that and saying, yeah, I'm just going to go with this. Turn up here, watch films, meet new people, go down, carry the cups around for the guys at the markets and meet and talk to people on the transition. So, so again, it's, 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 it's the permaculture answer. The, the, the answer's in the question questions in the answer, whichever way you want to call it, but I think being here tonight, you've answered the question in my eyes. Look, I, I think that's a really terrific thing to say. I, mm -hmm. I think we should be clear with ourselves. Because it's fearless. Yeah. You it's have fear, but you're yeah, fearless in yeah, talking about yeah. it. It's a really wonderful thing to hear Costa say, but we should be honest about this. No one has saved a planet before. We do not know what a sustainable society is. We're just doing the best we can. That's all we can do. And let's have some fun and give it a really good go and a laugh. Yeehaw. So, so one, um, one final question. Um, I come from New York City and uh, there was a recent article about um, chickens that, you know, there's this big, yay, we're going to raise chickens and eat the eggs. And um, they just did a big test of the eggs and a lot of the eggs are tox or have, you know, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, great question. One of the uh, first questions, other than the one, can we grow all our food, that I asked. And I got um, advice from one of Australia's leading soil scientists. Actually, plants are really clever. They're set up to exclude a lot of stuff. They can't exclude the stuff that was invented to get past it, pesticides and so on. But they're very good at excluding heavy metals and a whole range of things. If you look at any bit of our modern environment, there's stuff in it, whether it's DDT or whatever, and there'll be a, like, there'll, there'll be a story every two years about lead and rainwater. So it would have been a bad look for me to kill the kids, you know, I try and do a good thing, and I, the kids all died of lead poisoning, so I looked at all that too. That stuff is like kids going into a cupboard without the torch and scaring themselves. I did a job in Double Bay, top end of town, you know, vogue on the outside and vague inside. And I, I had a lot of passion in that job. And it's won lots of prizes. And talk about the Loch Ness mo Monster rearing up. We found mercury in the water. Despite the specifications that we put in the, in the um, drawings, the roofing material contain mercury and it's a very common product. You don't want mercury in your rainwater. I didn't sleep for a month and I went to the guy who's on the Australian government's international board. The, the key measure of vulnerability is a pregnant woman's child. And he said if she had drunk two litres or three litres of water every day for a year the fetus would not have been damaged but the, the level of mercury was about twice the level in the drinking water standards. As a lawyer I absolutely go for the 
for the truth and the facts. The standards that are set for drinking water in Australia are very highly politicised. But the data and the information, the specialist world quality advice I have, some of which is in the book, is that you can eat basically anything in the city. You just have to wash it the same as if you buy it from Coles or Woolies or whatever, but this is the difference. You know pretty well what's happened to that plant. If you go and get some garlic from Harris Farm or some um, asparagus from, um, from Peru, you have no idea. 80% of our OJ comes from South America and there's shit in that stuff. It's showing up in America where they have a more activist health regulator and it's in ours, but they don't do anything here because they don't have the resources or the political focus. I am very happy to be quoted. The, the data's in the book. You can eat food in a, any part of our cities except near the lead smelted in um, Port Pirie and a few other places at Broken Hill where there's a lot of lead in the air and some other stuff that does get past the plant's natural mechanisms. And the and the book is a starting point for for that assertion. So, chill. So it's thank thank you everyone for uh, coming along tonight. Thanks for your questions, um, and of course a big thank you to Michael for for really just opening up and talking about what where he's been, what he's done, and um, what it's led to in terms of not just his mind and his book. And, and that side of his world, but also his heart. So uh, thanks, Michael, for your time, and uh, thanks, everyone, for coming.